more from the Cantata Singers, a very large project which has unfolded over many years called Slavery Documents, a project that has been in three parts. The first part was written by the late Donald Sewer, a Boston composer, who I remember very well talking to at that time. The second part was written by T.J. Anderson and uh, had its own title. The third part of the Slavery Documents project is the work of Lior Navok, who is with me here today live in the studio. And it's a pleasure to have you at last to meet you after hearing so much of your music, Lior. Pleasure to be here. What? How did you, who live in Israel, come to be selected as the composer of this third part of this great project? Yeah. Well, I'm in part, in the past, actually, a Bostonian. So I used to be here for about uh, five, six years and um, work here. And uh, that's how I actually got to know David Hughes through Collage New Music. Uh, David Hughes, uh, at the time, uh, commissioned uh, a work for a chamber ensemble. And uh, from there, we took it into another level. And here we are with the Cantata Singers uh, Commission. So they previously had a piece from you? Uh, n- not the Cantata Singers, the Collage New Music. Oh, right, 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 right. Well, you have had pieces commissioned from everywhere. You're very busy. Busy days. schedule, yeah. <laughs> and the appeal of your music seems to be not only that it is, well, fresh and original, as music ought to be, but that there is something deeper. What is it that is your... What do you feel your personal mission is as a composer? Well, I feel that that in a way music should, to some extent, as a, act as a mirror and uh, reflect the listener, his or her inner thoughts that not necessarily come out on a daily life. Um, and sometimes words words cannot do it. Sometimes it's music that actually can penetrate deeper um, to these uh, types of emotions. So. And and these kind of um, ideas come from different sources. I mean, it comes from people. It comes from characters. I draw ideas from from uh, um, nature, from from the way uh, you know the way uh, rain is falling on the on the surface of of a lake, uh, from from certain sounds, um, and then from literature, of course. But there, you also have an a certain engagement with the issues of our time. I remember talking to John Adams about his sort of fearlessness leaping into the real uh, hot and conflicting issues of our time with his work. And um, There's a certain aspect of political engagement in your music as well. Is that Does that come out of just where you live, where you were born, and where you have spent much of your life in Israel? I guess I guess it's part of it. I guess it's part of it for sure. I mean, it is it is a re- recent recent phase actually because uh, because uh, that phase of um, looking at what's going on around us today and and reflect this through music is is relatively new. Um, this goes uh, actually to the piece that uh, collage. Uh, commissioned with David Hughes a uh, few years ago that kind of portray um, the September 11th events, uh, also in relations, uh, relation, of course, to the events in Israel uh, that uh, keep uh, going still. Um, then um, a Borromeo, a Borromeo Quartet right. uh, uh, performance of a Kusevitsky Foundation Commission uh, of a work called The Hope Cycles. Hope Cycles. That deals with the hopes and the despairs also of, uh, of uh, the individual uh, who lives uh, in an uh, in, uh, area where I live and uh, kind of s- deal with the conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, as it's seen from both sides. So not as the media portrayed, but as the individual who suffers from this conflict sees it. And uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, the subject uh, that uh, I brought uh, to cantata singers uh, deals with uh, a very, very hard subject, uh, which um, I must say uh, that... Uh, 
cantata singers took took it uh, under their wings and and um, adopted it with no problem. It's a whole new angle on the subject of slavery documents, which began with uh, very appropriately with a with a real in depth exploration of slavery in this country um, and looking at actual documents that became integrated in the text. How did this new angle uh, come up? Was it suggested to you by David Hoos? No. Uh, what's interesting about it is that uh, when I uh, sat with David and discussed uh, possibility for a new piece, uh, we didn't know exactly what, what the piece will be about. I mean, as far as I was concerned, it could be about, uh, you know, about stars or, or, or about, uh, I don't know, Life in Australia, but uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, which which must be great. Yeah. Uh, but um, what happened is that um, I went back to Tel Aviv with the task to uh, seek for a subject, and and uh, usually it takes forever to find the right text, the right subject, the right thing that resonates with with the musical uh, thoughts. Yeah, with you. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. As the artist. And, uh, and about a week later, I sit uh, with uh, a friend uh, for a cafe in Tel Aviv. And as you know, I mean, people take their time there at the cafe. It's about reflection. It's about really understanding things. Very unlike here. <laughs> <laughs> Almost no, no coffee to go. And, um, and he starts to talk to me about, about um, this book that he's reading. And he says, you know, Lear... I'm reading a book now about um, World War II, about uh, the Holocaust, about uh, the camps, about the trains, and about the the bombs, or actually the lack of bombs. And I said to him, you know, I mean, we studied the whole thing in elementary school, in high school, we know we know all about it. And he the, says, the trains being those that transported the, the Jews to the death camps. Yes. Right. And he says to me, uh, no, Lior, it's actually deeper than that. There was a lot of political, um, you know, political action behind behind that uh, uh, lack of um, action um, from from the Allies' uh, side, uh, as far as as far as bombing the the way to the camps, the tracks themselves, or even the camps uh, themselves. Uh, and um what did you find in your research yeah as as uh, as i started to look into that i uh, started to find documents that talk about about um willingness uh from from a certain organi- organization to have uh those um uh, railroads attacked or bombed and and the reluctance of the allies mostly the the british and uh, the Americans uh, to do something about it for various reasons, uh, because at the beginning they didn't really know for sure what was going on. It was kind of deceived as labor camps, and and then there was a stage where people were not sure if it's war rumors or real facts. But uh, later on, these facts be- became uh, more and more confirmed by by various people and by intelligence reports and by aerial maps or uh, uh, photographs. And uh, at that stage, um, th- the main question was, uh, can we reach the camps? And uh, technically, at a certain point, it was possible to reach them through uh, Italy. And um, But still, nothing was actually done to, to relieve the, the pain and the suffering or to save lives of people. That, And we are talking about something like 12,000 people um, on a daily basis going to these uh, camps. It sounds almost like a kind of default complicity in not intervening. Yes, uh, to to great extent, of course. Uh, but what one needs to understand also that it was a war and, and uh, there were many considerations uh, behind the whole thing. And, and one of the um, a war department consideration was uh, what is what do we need to do between between um, uh, army uh, missions and hum- humanitarian humanitarian missions, mm. and uh, that's in a way the big moral question. So, 
Uh, you're familiar, of course, with the uh, what I think is one of the great chamber pieces of of the late 20th century, and that's Steve Reich's Different Trains, in which he juxtaposes the trains that he traveled across America on as a youth with those death camp trains and uses yes. voices, actual speaking voices of Holocaust survivors to generate the pitches and the rhythms of the music. Uh, so your approach is, well, the question is, how do you go from these kinds of documents, uh, which... I assume are kind of dry into making a text that is a piece of art. Right. Um, I, I should first say that I really use the very authentic uh, documents, which I was uh, digging in many archives. And uh, yes, it's a big question. How do you take these dry documents and make them into music? But what was interesting about it is that while dealing with the documents and one once finding the right um, you know phrasings that people use or the right sentences, the documents started to speak on their own, and mm. the music started to come right out of them. And uh, in a way, when I was uh, at the phase of sketching the work uh, in front of the manuscript paper, I already had many uh, musical uh, remarks and uh, ideas on the copies of these uh, documents to the level of uh, who is the soloist, what kind of uh, melody, uh, what kind of uh, maybe harmony. And uh, I should say also that because I'm using um, many sources and many types of documents that come from different angles, uh, I used, for example, um, documentation of uh, a Nazi correspondence of train schedules. Um, everything was documented. Um, I found uh, documents between the British Colonial Office and uh, American uh, War Department, State mm. Department, uh, protocols of certain, uh, um, you know, uh, committees, uh, testimonies of people who escaped uh, the inferno, and uh, last letters of people that 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 died there. And each of these documents is speaking on its own. And uh, I mean, I just had to to release the voice out of the out of this document and that's what happened then the text is actually entirely uh, extraction extracts from the documents yes you have to write in some of your own glue <laughs> well the glue the glue was pretty pretty natural because um, I I started with about thousand documents that I found interesting out of right. out of <laughs> out of few more thousands that I was going through and uh, at that stage I was looking for the right link so in a way it's like a domino uh, you look for the five to put put to put uh, with the five and and so on and so on and uh, in a way the links became very very interesting because um, you have one testimony of someone that was locked uh, inside the gas chamber, for example, mm. and suddenly he hears um, very far noises and a big noise, a big, big kind of uh, action around him. Suddenly the doors open and uh, the Nazis release him, say, go back to go back to the barracks. What happened? Uh, the Allies attacked five miles away some uh, synthetic oil plant and there was a big uh, you know confusion and that's how he survived so huh. i found that document and then i found another document of saying please if you are bombing the the plants please consider bombing also the railroads that lead to mm. to the camps and and all these links that that kind of get one thing to the other uh, form the libretto so many of these documents are actually personal very personal voices, not yes. just the train schedules. Well, Lior Navok is my guest. He's written a brand new piece for the cantata singers, and the trains kept coming. It is the third part of their project called Slavery Documents, and you can get the information for all of it at cantatasingers.org or phone number 617-868-5885. Lior, is this... You're, is this? Have you written an, 
Any other pieces on this kind of grand scale, choral pieces? Um, as far as time, no. Mm. As far as uh, instrumentation, um, there is there is one uh, very large piece that um, MIT uh, choir and uh, wind ensemble did uh, t two three years ago called uh, "Glimpse from the Bosom of Darkness," that uh, portray um, so through sound portray light uh, because light has uh, different intensity and different color and different type of you know sometimes it's shimmer sometimes it's kind of dim light sometimes it's very bright mm. so I translated that to uh, the choral orchestral medium as well. Well, Lior Navok, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope it's a great success this weekend, uh, wrapping up a very big project with the Cantata Singers under David Hoos.